Hey, good morning and uh, welcome to the April 21st, 2023 Sandak Transportation Committee meeting. And I'll go ahead and call the uh, meeting to order. And before uh, I move forward, I would like to um, uh, have our interpreter um, explain how to access the interpretation. So Ruth, please go ahead. Thank you. I will repeat this message in English. Para hacer uso del servicio de interpretación, por favor desplácese a la parte inferior de la pantalla de Zoom donde aparecen los controles. Haga clic en el icono de interpretación que es el globo terráqueo y seleccione Spanish, español. Si está utilizando la aplicación móvil de Zoom en celular o tableta, presione los puntos suspensivos, luego Interpretation y luego el idioma. To use the interpreting feature, please scroll to the bottom of the Zoom screen where the meeting controls are located and click on the interpretation icon, the world, then select your language. If you are joining using the Zoom mobile app on a cell phone or tablet, please press the ellipses, then interpretation, and then choose your language. Thank you. Thank you. Our clerk for today is uh, Tessa Lero. And so uh, first I'd like to ask uh, our clerk, uh, Tessa, to confirm that we have a quorum with a roll call. Thank you. Um, roll call, San Diego County Regional Airport Authority, Mayor Sanchez. Present. And alternate Rafael Perez. Present. City of San Diego is absent. The County of San Diego, Supervisor Joel Anderson. East County Chair Jack Shu. Present. And Council Member Mendoza. A Metropolitan Transit System, Council Member Moreno. Present. North County Coastal, Council Member, I'm sorry, excuse me, Deputy Mayor Zito. Present. North County Inland is absent. North County Transit District, uh, Deputy Mayor Bhakt Patel. Here. Port of San Diego is absent. South County Councilmember Jose Rodriguez. Present. And for Caltrans, Ann Fox. Present. And Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association is absent, and that confirms a quorum. I think, did you get Councilmember Duncan for South County? He just stepped in. Thank you. Yes, also for South County Councilmember Duncan. Thank you. Excuse me. Sure. Let's go ahead with uh, public comments and we'll go with uh, two minutes to move along. So uh, we'll uh, go ahead and take uh, public comments. These are for items that are not on the agenda. So Tessa, do we have any uh, members of the public that would like to speak? Thank you. We do have public comments on non-agenda items. I have two in-person public commenters. The first is Nina. And I'm I'm going to apologize, Bob Beers. Uh, please go to the pretty close. It's actually Nina Babiars. Uh, it's uh, Nina is like Nina, Nina potato potato. <laughs> good morning, uh, good morning, Chair Shu, and everybody this morning. My name is Nina Babiars. I reside at eight five two zero T O Diego Place in La Mesa, California. I'm semi-retired from decades of work in intelligent transportation systems and alternative fuels. Um, I'm currently also volunteering as Director of Development for Public Watchdogs, which is a nonprofit organization. And our mantra is that the public has a right to know. Um, I want to give just a brief history. I, I provided Chair Shu my detailed uh, career background. Uh, I was a founding member of the California Alliance for Advanced Transportation Systems, which is now known as ITS California, uh, founding member of the Regional Transit Training Consortium, as well as uh, RTTA, the Regional uh, Transit Training uh, Alliance and uh, president of that organization. We met in this room, in the conference room for many years. Uh, I can go into, uh, as a founding member of uh, San Diego chapter in the 90s of WTS and served on that board twice, uh, also as legislative um, chair. But I'm here this morning, I came forward today to talk about the topic of vehicle miles traveled, and I have a simple request. 
Um, the vehicle miles traveled over the years. I've been in meetings for decades uh, regarding this topic. And of course, it started with fuel efficient vehicles of, you know, where are we gonna replace these gas taxes? Uh, it was also known at one time as VII, a little history vehicle infrastructure integration. Uh, but with all the media coverage and, uh, you know, there's been dissension between the perspectives of some of the board members of differing opinions. There's one critical component that's been overlooked and I believe missing uh, that SANDAG and this uh, transportation committee should consider. Uh, SANDAG has historically conducted community forums and workshops uh, public to get public input, but uh, that's what really happened on VMT. And the public uh, needs an opportunity to be informed as well as an opportunity to be heard. And I think, Chair Shu, you know, according to some of the work you've done, I think that you're aware of that, uh, that need by the public. Uh, Sandag's also missing an opportunity. Thank uh, you, not your only time to... has expired. Well, my request is that I, I I apologize, but you have you have been muted, and we need to move on. Thank you. Our next speaker is Tim Bailash. Please come to the podium, and you will be followed by Catherine Rhodes virtually. Good morning, committee. Uh, my name is Timothy Bailash, uh, Central San Diego Coastal, and I appreciate the time to talk. Um, a kind of a, a low level discussion. Uh, I wanted to have first a shout out to the audit committee. I attend some of their meetings, particularly the, the public members have done a really great job with some difficult issues the past uh, six months. So I just want uh, uh, transportation and, and whoever to be aware of that. I have three things to talk about this morning in the brief time, convenience, purpose, and enthusiasm. I drive down from the Del Mar area it takes me about 25 minutes if there's no traffic. I get in my car in my garage, I drive, park in your parking garage here, and in 25 minutes I can be up here talking to you. If I tried to come with public transportation, I would have to go to the Del Mar parking garage, walk over to the 101 bus, go to UTC, take the trolley, get out there, walk up here, and it's probably an hour and a half. So I would uh, urge Sandag and the transportation people to think about convenience, and that means different things for shippers and uh, from uh, people coming from the airport. So purpose is also an important issue. If I come once every year, that's not gonna help reduce vehicle miles traveled or the climate, which is a crisis. So uh, to try to distinguish the distinctions between the pass through of the 6 million cars into and out of our county every day um, from an occasional tourist that's driving down to Mexico. Uh, the other thing is I just want to encourage the enthusiasm I see in Sandag and to continue that. I appreciate the opportunity to talk, thanks. Thank you. I would like to state for the record that Port of San Diego Commissioner Naranjo and Southern California Tribal Chairman's Association Chairwoman Pinto are both present. And our final speaker is Catherine Rhodes. Catherine, please go ahead. Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes. Sad news. Last week, the City of San Diego's Land Use and Housing Committee voted to criminalize homelessness and poverty outside the coastal zone, led by our cruel strong mayor, Todd Gloria, and mean steep. Whitburn. Both council members Vivian Moreno and Joe LaCava voted to move downtown and Hillcrest homeless into the neighborhoods of Nestor, Barrio Logan, Midway, Point Lomish, Ocean Beach, Mission Beach, Pacific Beach, La Jolla, Torrey Pines, and Carmel Valley, which are in the coastal zone and need California Coastal Commission approval. But the state said cities have to solve their own homeless problem. So I'm requesting all San Diego cities and counties to tell the city of San Diego to stop criminalizing homeless and pushing them into neighboring cities instead of solving the problem themselves. Um, the city of San Diego created the problem by destroying 10,000 affordable housing units in the downtown center city redevelopment project area without the required replacement units or relocation expenses, creating 
ton, um, thousands of homeless seniors, many who have died. Last year, over 500 homeless deaths. The reason why Mayor Todd Gloria and Stephen Whitburn are criminalizing homeless right now is because they both plan, plan to run for re-election in 2024. Steve Whitburn is running to replace Nathan Fletcher on the County Board of Supervisors. Criminalizing homeless and poverty is a gift to rich property owners, political donors, and the police unions. When the city already gives $24 million to the San Diego Police Department only to terrorize the homeless during sweeps, $24 million for these sweeps to put people in poor people in jail. So far, three news organizations have proved that no shelter space exists for those that want them, but the city is still putting everybody in jail. Man, many homeless have testified that the police promised to take the poor homeless to shelters than when no shelter space is. Thank you. Your time has expired, and that concludes the public commenters. We'll take any comments from um, board members, any general comments? Anne? Gotcha. Good morning. I just wanted to share um, for upcoming Earth Day events um, that Caltrans, um, our district, will be participating in. Um, we have a couple coming up this weekend, this Saturday. We'll be out at the 53rd Annual Chicano Park Day celebration. There uh, we'll have our South County Trade Corridor group. Um, they'll be hosting a booth um, discussing, discussing um, Clean California and our Harbor Drive 2.0 projects. Uh, we'll also be out at the San Alijo State Beach for the Creek to Bay cleanup. Um, again, our, our North County corridor groups and our build NCC team will be out there picking up litter uh, along the beach um, there. Uh, the following weekend, uh, Saturday the 29th, uh, we'll be participating in the 2023 Tribal Earth Day there um, in Santa Isabel. Um, there we'll have a booth to discuss Clean California and Middle Mile Broadband. Um, and then we'll also be out in uh, Spring Valley, uh, the Earth Day Festival there. Uh, we'll again have our Central Corridors group um, hosting a booth, again talking about Clean California, and we'll also have information there to um, talk about the 94-125 interchange. So just wanted to share that. Thank you. Nick, any other commissioners? Yes. I just wanted to take the opportunity to congratulate National City on repealing the cruising ban, which unfairly targeted black and brown lowriders who can now legally express their culture of lowriding without criminalization. And uh, I'll stop by the Caltrans booth at Chicano Park Day. I will have my lowrider there. Thank you. <laughs> if there aren't any comments, let me make a quick, uh, quick uh, comment. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I sent out a email uh, with a reading material for all of you, which uh, uh, had to do with the road use uh, issue, which is a non-discussion item, but I just wanted to let all the uh, members know that uh, if you have material um, that is uh, from um, uh, either professional or um, planning organization, government organization on issues that you think that are important for this commi committee members to know, please uh, let me know. Uh, I don't want to monopolize uh, homework assignments for this committee, <laughs> but in any case, I, I do believe that it, we need to be well informed on transportation issues. Uh, so I hope to uh, bring to you uh, other materials um, in, in the months to come. So I hope you don't mind that, uh, but I hope that you also find the information uh, helpful as we go forward with uh, the work of this committee. Uh, with that, uh, next we have the agency report and we have Antoinette for that. Yeah, good morning. Thank you, everyone. My name is Antoinette Meyer. I'm your Director of Regional Planning here at SANDAG. Um, and I'm going to provide the update on agency activities and progress on our priority projects. So a uh, big thing this week was that a handful of staff and board members um, traveled to Washington, D.C. as part of the annual chamber trip. And while they were there, they had the opportunity to meet with leadership from Customs and Border Protection and the General Services Administration to continue discussions related to advancing the construction of the Otay Mesa East Port of Entry Project. Also last week, uh, the San Diego region received a visit from the Federal Railroad Administration. So Congressman Mike Levin hosted the administrator of the FRA, Amit Bose, who rode the coaster to experience uh, the Los San Corridor firsthand. 
Um, and related to that on Monday, passenger rail service uh, was restored to Orange County. It was six and a half months um, of doing the necessary repairs so that the um, line could be safely reinstated. And this really underscores the need for this con to continue to be a priority for Sandag to move the rail line off the fragile Delmar Bluffs. And um, last week, we actually interviewed consultants to select a team to perform the environmental clearance and the advanced conceptual engineering work for the realignment project. Also happy to share that Sandag and Caltrans recently received a few awards for the Build MCC project. The American Public Works Association and the American Society of Civil Engineers chose Build MCC as the project of the year. And ASCE named Build MCC the winner in the outstanding transportation project category. Um, this week, uh, our Central Mobility Hub and Connections team released the draft comprehensive, <laughs> comprehensive multimodal corridor plan, CMCP is much easier to say, um, to the public for a 45-day comment period, and that's available on the SANDAG website, so please help us get the word out about that. This really builds on the regional plan to enhance connectivity of the airport and improve travel in the surrounding communities, and completion of that allows us to begin to apply for SB1 funding. Um, and then last but not least, we continue uh, planning work for the Blue Line Express and the Purple Line studies. We're in the process of selecting consultant teams. The RFPs have just recently gone out um, to conduct these studies. And at your next meeting um, in May, we'll be bringing a more detailed update on the scope and schedule um, for those projects. So that concludes my report, Chair. Thank you. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, do we have any public comments on this on the report? I have one public commenter on this item. Catherine Rhodes, please go ahead. Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes, and thank you for the report. It's a great report, but it's missing a huge, gigantic thing. It's the issue I keep on bringing up. It's the liquefiable soils there. And in your report, it says that there's only a limited area that's going to be affected but you forgot to mention that areas are being affected right now. Right on Midway Drive right now in front of the post office and over by the sports arena, when there's kick tides, the area floods and there's flooding, um, you know, from um, because the area was a former salt marsh. And so you guys are not talking about anything um, that I brought forward to be put into the analysis of this report of what I call my La Playa plan is a full tideland reclamation, where we actually get rid of all that junky liquefiable soils. And your plan right now is just to build on top of it, which is not really a plan. It's It, it doesn't do anything to future-proof the area of former salt marshes against sea level rise. Um, so I think your sea level rise analysis should include ex existing flooding. Um, and what's going to happen when we have the king tides again. And so um, I don't think this is a, um, I think you should do, a, 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 um, you should have this as a draft, but I think what you need to do is do a bigger analysis and actually analyze my La Playa plan. The La Playa plan, what it would do is it would take, a, take out all the shifting sands. You know, even in the Bible, it says, do not build on shifting sands. And all your plan does is everything just above, ground. I'm talking about everything that should be below ground to take out, out these shifting sands so you could build everything on a good foundation. And then you could um, future-proof the area against sea level rise. Thank you so much. Thank you. That concludes the public commenters. Any comments or questions from com committee members? Hearing none, uh, thank you for the report, and we'll move on to uh, the consent agenda. Um, move approval by Sanchez. Second. Oh, uh, Councilman Duncan, you have a comment? Yes, I have a comment. Thank you. I have no problem with the motion. I'll be voting for it to approve it. But I just had a question, and it doesn't have to be answered immediately, but on the March 17th minutes, it mentions on item number seven, I'm sorry, on number item number six um, from the last minutes that the facilitating access to coordinated transportation update would be postponed to the next scheduled meeting. And I don't see that on our agenda today. So I assume it's for some reason, it's probably gonna be on the next agenda, but um, 
it may be helpful in the future that if we have something from our a prior meeting postponed to the next scheduled meeting, we just go ahead and put that on this agenda that what happened to that and where it's going. So with that comment, um, I'm done. Thank, Thank you. you. And, and I've just been informed it's May 19th because the person making the presentation is out of town. So, so it, it did get uh, delayed. Thank you for making that Thank point. Thank you, Chair. Uh, hearing none, we can go ahead and uh, vote from the consent calendar with uh, Member Sanchez making motion and forgot who made the second, Moreno. Motion passes unanimously with those members present. Thank you, Mr. Chair. If I yes. could just make a comment, I apologize. It's not reflecting my vote of uh, thank you. And I would like to say for the record, there were no public comments on the consent agenda. Thank you. Um, and let's go ahead and go to um, uh, reports. So item number five is the um, FY 2024 regional uh, transit capital improvement program. We have um, Wailena and Richard here to present uh, this item along with uh, staff from MTS and, and NCTC. Good morning, Chair Shu and Transportation Committee members. I'm Wailena McCambridge, Financial Analyst at Sandag. Here with me today is Richard Radcliffe, Financial Analyst at Sandag. Mike Thompson, Director of Financial Pr Programming and Analysis at MTS, and Un Park Lynch, Chief Financial Officer at NCTD. We are here today to present item number five, the Fiscal Year 2024 Transit Capital Improvement Program, also known as the CIP. The Transit CIP is a rolling five-year program that's updated each year by MTS and NCTD to prioritize and program transit, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to um, prioritize and program transit capital and rehabilitation projects. As the Metropolitan Planning Organization for the San Diego region, SANDAG is the designated recipient for FTA formula funding. There are three FTA formula programs that are the primary source of funding for the transit agency CIPs. These programs are described in more detail in attachment one. The SANDAG Board of Directors is responsible for approving the submittal of these FTA grant applications by MTS and CTD and SANDAG based on the CIP <coughs> and for the related programming of these projects in the RTIP. Uh, Richard will give more information about the RTIP. Thank you, Wailena, and good morning, Transportation Committee members. Uh, the FTA grant application process requires that all projects are included in an approved Regional Transportation Improvement Program, or RTIP, and as a reminder, the RTIP is the five-year program of proposed major transportation projects in the San Diego region. And the current RTIP is the 2023 RTIP, which covers fiscal years 2023 through 2027. This item includes Amendment 3 to the 2023 RTIP, which adds the FY 2023 through 2027 programmed funding. The details of Amendment 3 are provided in Attachments 4 through 8. MTS and NCTD's total combined funding for the FY24 Transit CIP is 405.1 million for FY24 and 1.8 billion over the five-year period. The transit agencies each develop their own CIPs, which are approved by their respective board of directors. The NCTD board approved its CIP on January 19th, 2023, and the MTS board approved its CIP yesterday, April 20th. I will now hand it over to MTS and NCTD, who are here today to present an overview of their FY24 CIP programs. Good morning. My name is Mike Thompson, again, with MTS. And before we talk about the actual program, we want to talk about our overall policies and procedures around this CIP. So we do have a board policy around transit asset management, and it states that MTS is committed to effectively manage its transit assets and maintain its system in a state of good repair um, to support safe, efficient, reliable transit services across the organization. And 
This is required as part of our um, underlying regulations with the Federal Transit Administration, the Federal Railroad Administration, and the California Public Utilities Commission. And state grid repair is really what we base our CIP on first. Um, all the capital project prioritization starts with the state of good repair. And you can see the chart on the right of the screen looks at our 20 year CIP forecast. State of good repair alone is $2.5 billion over that 20 years. So it's over $120 million a year just in maintaining the existing assets that we have. Um, to develop our CIP, the process started last September. Um, each department in the organization submits an update to their 20 year forecast and also submits specific projects for the next five years. And then they also prioritize those departments internally. And then that is all consolidated agency-wide. And then a capital project review committee meeting was held to discuss you know, funding that list to what the funds are available. Um, so there's always more projects requested than to others available. So this committee is responsible for prioritizing that list. And projects with safety and or operational needs are priority one. The committee reviewed and CEO approved the priority list that was included in the, in the attachment. And all priority ones were funded at least partially. The project list is also subject to an analysis based on social equity principles, and there was no disproportionate impact on low income or minority populations. The next slide looks at the five-year unconstrained need. So the five-year unconstrained total is $1.1 billion. Um, and the table on the right breaks it into the categories we typically look at. Main category is bus revenue vehicles. That is $300 million over this five years. That does include the transition to zero emission buses as we are required to purchase zero emission buses over this five-year period. It also includes $85 million for rail revenue vehicles. It includes $74 million for facility projects. This is our bus facilities. It is also our, our trolley yard, and it's also all the passenger facilities as well. And there's $200 million approximately for rail infrastructure, and then another $45 million of other equipment installation. Those five categories are basically our state of good repair categories. Outside of state of good repair, we do have some other initiatives in this CIP. It's a total of $416 million. It is primarily related to zero emission buses. We need to retrofit all of our existing bus maintenance facilities to charge electric buses. We are also going to need another facility to fully transition to zero emission bus. We're not gonna have enough space to manage the service that we have on the street right now. So that's built into this budget as well. It's called the Clean Transit Advancement Campus and it will be our sixth bus division. And there are also some smaller initiatives in the out years on, under other initiatives. This next slide looks at what's being funded in the current fiscal year. You can see $118 million in total is being funded towards state of good repair projects, starting with bus revenue vehicles of $61 million. Um, our rail revenue vehicles is $22 million. We have a couple more years of funding our SD100 replacements and take the system 100% low floor. And then after that, we'll need to start saving to replace our next fleet, the, the SD7s that were for Mission Valley East. Um, we have about $3 million being funded for bus facility projects with a total five-year need in that category of about $16 million. We have a $4 million for our rail facilities. We have another $4 million for passenger projects as well. Um, rail infrastructure is basically two types of things. One type is anything related to the physical track or where the track meets the road or where track meets other track. We're funding about $10 million this next fiscal year on those type of projects. And the need over five years for that type of stuff is $104 million. And the other type of rail infrastructure is everything around the track in the right of way and also the electrification of the entire system and the signaling as well. We're funding $9 million of those type of projects in this fiscal year. And the total five you need there is also about $100 million. And then other equipment installation, there's some on the operations side, but primarily that's in the admin side and it's IT systems and infrastructure and network equipment. It's about $5.5 million in other equipment funded. So again, you can see about $118.5 million going just towards state of repair. And the state of repair need over the five years is $700 million, which is about $140 million a year. And that exceeds really our recurring revenue streams that we have identified at this point in time. The other initiatives within the CIP starts with the innovative clean transit infrastructure. Um, again, we are required to start purchasing um, zero emission buses and then be 100% purchases by 2030. So 
we need to retrofit all of our existing bus maintenance facilities to, to charge either electric buses or hydrogen buses. Um, and you can see there's about um, $15 million going towards those type of projects across all of our various um, bus maintenance divisions. We're also putting away about $37 million towards a new campus, uh, the Clean Transit Advancement Campus, that again will facilitate our overall transition to um, zero emission buses. This need is for almost $400 million over the five year period. Most of that is in that facility, but $88 million is in retrofitting our existing facilities. And that retrofit is basically a phased approach too. So we're doing a little bit at each facility and then we have to go back and add more capacity at each facility. So that whole process is gonna take about 20 years. We do have some other funding identified for this next CAP that is not state of and not innovative clean transit. We have a $2 million assigned to a social equity listening tour. Um, the projects that result out of that, we want to have some funding available to do those projects. We're also putting about a million dollars towards our 12th Amir Transit Center. Um, this is um, just a competitive funding that we received. And then we're also, also at Imperial, we're also double tracking the green line at that end point. We need another $500,000 for that project. So in total here, it's about $4 million of funding. And in the out years, we are funding some expansion projects. So the total here for five years is $28 million. So rolling everything up, again, $1.1 billion in total project need. We had 218 million in current fiscal year 24 of project requests. We had 175 million of project funding. So we were able, only able to fund 80% of the project needs for the current fiscal year. And if you look out to the five years, we've identified about $736 million of revenues against the $1.1 billion in projects. We are unfunded by about $388 million or 66% funded. And with that, turn it over to NCTD. Good morning, committee members. Um, I am uh, Yoon Park Lynch, the CFO for the North County Transit District, and I will be presenting the capital improvement program for NCTD for the next uh, five fiscal years. Uh, within the uh, framework of a capital program, NCTD is responsible for state of good repair projects uh, with the capacity enhancement project falling under the management of SANDAC. So within that framework, uh, we have developed the uh, five-year priorities for the next five fiscal years, which include uh, growing ridership and also improving the service quality for our customers. Uh, within uh, that framework, we are advancing projects that can be implemented quickly and can enhance the customer riding experience. We are also uh, developing a CAP where we can improve the reliability for our sprinter service 
as well as enhancing safety and security for our revenue vehicles and facilities. Uh, again, uh, from the uh, one of the biggest priorities for NCT as well is to ensure that we successfully implement our surgical repair and also our priority capital needs. Uh, we have been able to secure funding from the uh, Federal Railroad Administration for uh, as well as using some of our local match to advance um, improvements on the San Diego subdivision as well as the Escondido subdivision. So San Diego subdivision serves the Lawson Corridor and the Escondido subdivision is the uh, railroad for a sprinter service. We also have, uh, we are also developing, developing funding strategies to implement priority projects uh, for our breeze speed and reliability study. And we are also working on technology enhancements that can advance the delivery of projects and also improve project reporting. One of the priorities as well for the next uh, five fiscal years, uh, partly related to the mandate from the uh, state of California, is that we are looking at advancing to zero emission uh, program. That includes uh, developing capital needs assessment for potential infrastructure and shop needs to support rail, which includes sprinter and coaster, zero emission operations, we are also working on developing performance specifications to support the procurement of one or more prototype rail vehicles for our pilot projects and re the replacement of a breeze CNG fleet with a hydrogen fuel cell electric buses. Uh, NCT was, was able to successfully uh, secure funding for the design build of a brand new uh, hydrogen uh, station, uh, which is currently in the design phase uh, with the, and it will have the capacity to support 50 uh, hydrogen fuel cell buses, uh, which for which we have already ordered the first 12. Uh, this table uh, illustrates the capital needs. These are the unconstrained. Unconstrained means that they are not subject to financial constraints. This is only related to state of grid repair projects. Uh, in a further slide, I will show what are the capacity handling projects that are managed by Sanda. But this one is uh, for the most part, a state of repair projects for NCTD. As you can see, most of our capital needs are associated with uh, state of repair projects on the rail transit ways and lines. Uh, that includes the uh, San Diego subdivision as well as the Escondido subdivision, as well as uh, following by the uh, replacement of rail rolling stock and bus support equipment and facilities. In the $379 million that you saw on the prior slide, this is a, a summary breakdown of the large Sprinter transmission replacements, as well as breeze engines, transmissions, and rebuilds. Other projects that are new uh, in our CFP but are considered to be high priority uh, include the uh, mostly geared to uh, improving the rider experience, also as well for our customers. They include wayfinding and signage at stations, um, bus stop, et cetera. That's about $6 million, as well as customer service improvements and bus stops, ticket vending machines, validations, and train notifications. And uh, other uh, capital needs include the structural repairs on bridge 225.4, 
as well as replacing our white fleet uh, non-revenue vehicles. Uh, in the uh, last bullet point, those are the projects that are currently not funded based of lack of current fi financial viability. Uh, we don't have the funding for these, but there's, these are considered to be significant projects. Uh, the, uh, they include the CP songs design and construction, Springer double tracking, uh, improvements on our east and west bus operations and maintenance facilities, uh, the repair and replacement for multiple bridges, uh, rail data collection upgrade, uh, seven hydrogen fuel cell buses, uh, as one of the requirements for the uh, funding for the design build of the hydrogen station, uh, we are required to have a minimum of 25 uh, buses. So these uh, seven final buses uh, are the ones to comply with that requirement. Uh, we also have to replace uh, obsolete signal control equipment as well as needed improvements on a PTC software system. Uh, this next slide, these are projects that are managed by SANDAC. Uh, those are not uh, state of repair projects. They are for the most part expansion projects. As you can see, um, this data is based on uh, numbers provided uh, by SANDAC back in December of 2022. Uh, the largest projects being the Sorrento Timmermar phase two, um, $276 million. So uh, the first number reflects the total project cost estimated in back in December. And the amount in parentheses means uh, the amount of uh, funding that's not um, yet available. Uh, we, have, as you can see in these slides, there are some projects that are shovel ready, uh, meaning that design has been completed, but yet there's no funding for construction. Uh, largest ones being uh, the San Diego Lagoon double track and platform by the Guido's Lagoon is put to shell. Uh, other projects that also are um, capacity enhancement projects, but there's no funding as well, include the Carza Village double track, the Carza Village trench, the San Luis double track, as well as the San Diego to Sorrento Miramar uh, realignment project. Uh, this slide uh, shows in summary, what is our proposed construction CIP. Uh, these are the projects that can be advanced based on the current funding. Uh, it is only uh, $97 million from the close to $380 million capital needs. Most of our funding is going to be a uh, program for rail rolling stock, as well as the improvements on the uh, rail transit ways and lines. A lot of that funding is uh, committed by either you know, project agreements, uh, grant agreements, as well as projects already ongoing and the equipment has already been ordered. Uh, the CIP for this coming fiscal year of FY2024 is close to $50 million. Uh, for FY25, it's 23 uh, with you know, ongoing uh, reductions as the uh, available funding you know, is for the most part committed for the first uh, two fiscal years. But as uh, one of the biggest strategies for NCTD to continue funding our state of group projects, our state of group projects is to continue pursuing discretionary grants. So as we get more grants uh, in uh, the pipeline, those are added to our CIP. Uh, I am available for any questions and that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Let's go to public comments next if, if, if the report's finished. I think you have one public commenter on this item. Catherine Rhodes, please go ahead. Uh, hello, this is Catherine Rhodes. And they always say you can't create new waterfront public land, but yes, you can. My La Playa plan for full tide land reclamation would make new subsurface space on areas of liquefiable soils on public former salt marsh tide lands. This could create subsurface space for transportation and structural cisterns for water capture. Specifically, this could create um, public space for you guys to have um, your bus maintenance facilities in the downtown area. Where, um, you know, basically, it's um, west of the train tracks where the liquefiable soils are. And so you could actually create space, plus what you would do is you would take away the seismic hazard of liquefaction. And instead of everybody building on the shifting sands, they could actually be built on um, a good foundation with all your um, your bus maintenance facilities and, and all the space you have ever wanted um, for free, um, you know, um, right there on our public lands. And then also want to remind you, of course, of the, um, of the funding sources that could pay for that. Um, so you could get funding 
state and federal funding sources for reclamation projects for stormwater capture. And you also have that 2021 FAA change that allows um, for non-exclusive use of airport revenue to be used for transit in general. And you guys still haven't analyzed that in your, um, so I would recommend that your legal team um, analyze that um, for MTS also and for SANDAG. And then remember the um, county still has in the federal ARPA funding 500 million as of January in this fund. And so I think you guys should ask for 100 million of this money to be used for the poor and equity. And, um, and then, you know, I'm not sure if you know, but the state just recently gave um, or is giving control of our submerged tidelands in San Diego Bay to the port of San Diego. And so what this could do is that we could, um, we could create. Your time has expired. That concludes the public commenters. Thank you. Um, any uh, comments or questions from uh, committee members? I oh, have I'm a sorry. question. I, I'm not good with my peripheral. That's, that's Go okay. ahead. Look Sorry. this way. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, for NCTD, um, uh, with respect to um, increasing ridership, um, is, and I'm not sure what the CIP uh, requirements would be for this, but um, is NCTD uh, studying uh, perhaps um, uh, like what would be like a priority um, destination for say co connectors to try to increase ridership by making it easier to get to a place that has a, a destination that has that that is widely used, for example, um, uh, Maricosta or Tri City Hospital or the courthouse. Is there are there any studies to see if there could be a demonstration project that would actually get um, more more people riding, say the Sprinter, if they if it was easier to get to these destinations? So um, last year, uh, NCTD. Um, uh, uh, contracted with Deloitte to uh, perform a market study analysis to consider all different options uh, with having in mind, obviously, the increase in ridership. Uh, so um, our planning department continues working with you know, developing potential you know, uh, service improvements. One of the things that is budgeted for our fiscal 2024 uh, program is the continuation of our pilot microtransit connections for Sorrento, uh, Poinsettia, and also for the Vista Transit Center. So, um, yes, so we are definitely uh, increasing our ridership and also improving the rider experience is one of our top priorities. And we have uh, several studies in progress uh, to you know, to see how can we accomplish that. Thank you. I would, I would encourage looking at Oceanside, which does have several stops on the Sprinter, because um, I, do, I do believe some of these um, places that I uh, mentioned um, would... Um, You'd, you'd get more ridership if um, if there if it was easier if there was a connector to because a lot of students still go to you know there a lot of students go to Maricosta certainly the hospital major destination and the courthouse and maybe even the mall <laughs> but yeah thank you very much any other questions or points from Ms. Do we need two motions on this? Is two, two items on one and two? We could do a combined one action. One action. Thank I'll you. I'll second. So, so moved by us uh, and seconded by Sanchez. Any other comments? If not, uh, well, let's go ahead and take a vote. That motion passes with those members present. Great, thank you. Let's move on to item number six. Uh, There's an update on the regional uh, medium and heavy duty uh, zero emission vehicle blueprint. And we have uh, Jeff to give us a presentation. Get my phone in my pocket here. Give me a second. There we go. All right. Hi, uh, my name is Jeff Oyos. I'm a senior planner here at Sandag on the climate team within the planning department, and I'm here to provide an overview and an update on our regional medium duty, heavy duty, zero emission vehicle blueprint 
which is really for trucks and buses and how we're getting to zero emissions. So let's get into it. I have three things I want to talk to you about today. I'll give you an overview of the background of the overview of the project, excuse me, and the background while we're doing this, some of the infrastructure needs that we've established through this project so far. And today we're really talking about the siting criteria. So we're looking for recommendations and input on our siting criteria. Um, and then uh, at the end of here, we'll talk about next steps and discussion for the blueprint. We're looking to publish the blueprint in early 2024. All right, so um, why are we doing a, a blueprint and why are we focusing on zero emission uh, trucks and buses specifically is because we have a, a number of ambitious state goals that are directing the state of California to transition to zero emission trucks, buses, and um, passenger vehicles. You may have heard about the 100% sale requirement for zero emission vehicles in California. So if you're looking at to buy a vehicle in 2035 and beyond, it's going to be zero emission. Um, but there are also some regulations around trucks, including dredge trucks and long haul trucks, as well as buses. You heard a little bit about the innovative clean transit rule that you, uh, from the transit authority just a second ago. So let's jump into a little bit of that. So like I mentioned, you just heard a little bit about the innovative clean transit efforts that are happening with the transit agencies. Um, but there's also the advanced clean trucks regulation uh, or rule which sets standards or requirements for manufacturers of trucks to transition to zero emission. And on the other side of that, we're expected to see the advanced clean fleet regulation from CARB later this year, which will set purchase requirements for public fleets, as well as zero emissions requirements for drayage and high priority fleets. So clean transportation is woven throughout our regional plan. Um, and to address this, uh, we've kind of bucketed it into three different ways. We have incentive programs, innovative pilots, and planning studies and regional strategies. Today, we're talking specifically about a regional strategy, the blueprint, but I'd be happy to come back and talk a little bit more about our pilots or incentive programs. So um, this is a picture of where we are at the regional level right now on all types of vehicles, including passenger vehicles, medium duty and heavy duty. Um, as of 2022, we had about 100,000 vehicles in the region that are zero emission. But uh, based on a forecast we did in 2021, we're looking at needing over 100, 770 vehicles in our region by 2030 and uh, the associated infrastructure that goes with it. We wanted to dig a little bit deeper and understand what that means and what that looks like for trucks and buses here in the region. And so this slide here shows the number of trucks and buses that we're looking at being zero emission by 2040. And uh, based on our fair share of state regulations, we're looking at about 70,000 vehicles on, on the road here that will be zero emission, whether or not that's battery electric or hydrogen. We're expecting the, the, the lion's share of that to be battery electric with a smaller portion being fuel cell electric. The, the rest of those vehicles will remain uh, diesel and gasoline for the foreseeable future as we transition and work through those life cycles of the vehicles. It's not going to be an overnight transition. So we're working to understand the criteria that can help support the infrastructure for these trucks and buses. And um, before I jump too far, much farther into the criteria and these uh, the, the needs, really, the even though that um, trucks and buses make up a smaller percentage of our overall regional fleet. They do provide the uh, a disproportionate amount of uh, particulate matter, uh, nitric oxides, sulfuric oxides, and those are really um, detrimental to uh, population's health. They lead to asthma, ER visits. The American Lung Association just released a report on our air quality here in the region, and we got an F. Uh, but we are making some progress. We are seeing some increase in our air quality and associated uh, or correlated with that less trips to the ER, better uh, asthma within or less asthma within kids. So by making a transition to zero emission trucks and buses, we're going to be reducing that diesel particulate matter, matter which will really support our, our, our health here in the region. Um, and we're looking at portside communities. We're looking at the entire region. Since air doesn't really follow borders, we're looking at how we can uh, increase transitions uh, across the region and throughout the state. Um, but specifically for this study here, looking at the San Diego region. So for all that 70,000 vehicles that I just mentioned, um, we need charging infrastructure and fueling infrastructure to support that. We're expecting the majority of that infrastructure will be private, so depot charging, overnight charging, um, but there will be the need for public charging, which includes uh, folks that cannot charge at their own depot. So you may not have access to charging or fueling infrastructure at your depot, so you need to do that throughout the day. Or potentially you have a route that's too long to meet the demands of a battery or a fuel cell electric truck. And so you would need to uh, use some opportunity charging or public charging. So while we're looking at a pretty large number for chargers needed here in the region by 2040, only 3,200 of those need to be public or are expected to need to be public. Uh, I don't have a slide here today on the hydrogen. I don't believe so, at least, yep, I do not. Um, but we're looking at about 83 hydrogen stations here in the region, which is a, equivalent to 65,000 kilograms of hydrogen per day um, being delivered to trucks. All right, so 
that's the needs assessment. We did this this past uh, winter, and so we got a really good understanding of what our region needs as far as vehicles go and infrastructure. We are now working on developing the siting criteria for vehicles and infrastructure. So that's what we'll be talking about here in the next couple of slides. And then long-term, or, or the next step of this strategy here is to develop near and long-term implementation strategies, which will help guide SANDAG's investments as well as regional um, best practices to accelerate their transition to zero emission, because we're not gonna be able to do this alone. <clears throat> it's gonna be partnerships with the transit agencies, SANDAG, um, we partnered with the Port of San Diego on this blueprint effort, as well as the Environmental Health Coalition. So it's really going to take a number of regional players here to reach our uh, pretty ambitious state goals and our fair share of those goals. All right, so we know that the lack of infrastructure is really one of the largest uh, contributors or significant barriers to not being able to adopt zero emission vehicles. Uh, it's the chicken and the egg question, right? Um, and so we're developing the siting criteria to help address that chicken and the egg, understand better where we can be putting charging infrastructure that will benefit the public um, and hopefully reduce some of those costs that are associated with the public infrastructure as well. We've broken this down into five different categories for the criteria. We have utilization, land use, equity, grid capacity, and environmental considerations. So I'm going to spend, um, oops, I'm going to spend just a couple seconds here before uh, before I get to the end of here to talk a little bit about each one. Um, and so you can get better, a little bit of better understanding. But this uh, draft is out for public comment and input. So um, if you could, if you, if you, I know I've been doing this roadshow for a while, and uh, I've been reaching out to your staff. But um, we're, we're looking for input through the for this report through the rest of this month and we're going to be finalizing it in May. So when we talk about the criteria, we're looking at utilization. So the potential demand or the potential utilization of a site, how many vehicles are passing that site in a day? Uh, how long do they normally dwell within that area? Um, where is their end use or where is their end destination? Where are they starting? And how can we uh, support um, by providing public infrastructure that, that really would otherwise not be able to transition to zero emission? Related to that is land, scalability, the size of the land. Trucks are big. You, know, you have to have enough space in order to put the charging infrastructure, the hydrogen infrastructure, and then also make sure that they can get in and out without having traffic issues. Um, also, are there amenities available? Best practices around that are being considered here within this criteria. We're also looking at equity considerations. Um, the majority of the trucks that we see in the region are impacting our, our communities like around the port side or at the border areas. And so, uh, we want to understand and, and provide criteria that can support um, ensuring that those communities are seeing electric trucks and zero emission trucks. Um, and we're thinking about it doing that in two ways, by, by putting charging infrastructure within those communities so that we are replacing and not adding trucks to those communities, but also by putting charging infrastructure or fueling infrastructure outside of those communities um, on the way to those communities so that when folks are able to charge on the way in, they, they may not need to add an additional station within the community that you're seeing, like, for example, the port side communities. We also need to be considering and thinking about grid capacity. Um, these chargers for trucks are, they, they take a, a good amount of power. Um, and as you look at transitioning, you know, that 70,000 vehicle number or the 3,200 chargers in the region, that's gonna be a lot of power demand. And so we need to be working with the, uh, the utilities now so that we can understand what we're looking at as far as grid capacity needs in the future. Does the site currently have enough capacity? What does that look like as far as scaling up long-term? Um, and then also how can we integrate renewables, battery storage, microgrids, to ensure resiliency of these stations um, so that in case that there's a power safety shutoff, you're still able to get access to the charging infrastructure or also um, reduce the cost of the charging infrastructure or the cost to charge your vehicle or to fuel your vehicle. If you're able to tie in renewables and uh, battery storage, you're then able to discharge that battery during times when the energy would be more expensive. So in the evenings or overnight, um, and you reduce that overall cost to the consumer. And then lastly, some of your more traditional planning elements include environmental considerations, CEQA and NEPA. Uh, are you redeveloping or are you developing on a green field? Um, and then also um, you need to make sure you put in these stations in places that are not gonna get uh, flooded or put underwater and short everything out and that's a bad day. So uh, I didn't go through every single criteria. Uh, I think that'd be too much to, for today. I don't want to put you guys to sleep, but I'd be happy to answer any questions if there's specific questions here on the criteria um, or in, in a follow-up. Um, as a summary here, we developed that needs assessment this past winter that informed um, our, our vehicle needs, our infrastructure needs. We're looking at criteria now for vehicle, uh, excuse me, for charging infrastructure, fueling infrastructure. We also, as part of that criteria, developed a flow chart for owners and operators to better understand which vehicles may suit their needs. At the end of the day, the owners and operators are gonna know which vehicles need uh, they need. Um, so we just provided some considerations some best practices uh, for folks who may not be as um, in, 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 in the weeds, to, so to speak, as far as electric vehicles. 
Um, we're developing imp implementation strategies now. We started that yesterday with our team, and we'll be bringing draft implementation strategies back to this group this, uh, this summer, finalizing those strategies this fall, and wrapping everything that I just talked about into a draft blueprint for review this fall, and then final this, uh, or excuse me, early 2024. So with that, that uh, concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, let's go to um, public comments or first. There are no public commenters on this item. Thank you, Tessa. Uh, any member comments? Yes. Ms. Sanchez. Um, is there a either a website or a ma an app um, to be able to locate the, lo the nearest public um, charging? We, the, yeah, there are, there are two sites that I would recommend. There's the Alt Field Data Center, which is the, from the feds, and it looks at all the stations across the United States. Um, and there's also PlugShare, which is a, a pretty user-friendly application that you can use as well. Um, right now, I don't believe either of them break it out by medium duty, heavy duty, or uh, light duty charging. The majority of the chargers that we see throughout the region are focused on light duty, um, but we are starting to roll out some of those medium duty, heavy duty infrastructure locations um, and should probably be an update within one of these or, or both of the, the websites in the near future. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Commissioner Naranjo. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Thank you for the update and presentation. Um, so I just want to, uh, I do have a couple of questions, but I want to just start off with uh, a lobby trip I just did a couple of weeks ago. I, I joined um, ports across the country and my sister California ports to lobby the EPA and the Department of Transportation for electrification dollars to help transition our trucks. And one of the advice that the Department of Transportation told us, uh, the California ports, is that we need to go back to our region and come back with a regional plan with non-funding solutions so we can get those dollars because the EPA has like $3 billion, right, for electrification. And so um, coming back here regionally, locally, um, if you can help me understand how, you know, the work that's being done here at Sandec, because I know you are working with staff at the Port of San Diego and other, other agencies, but how you're functionally implementing so for example we have the ab 617 uh community emissions reduction plan uh we have the port of san diego's maritime clean air strategy mcas which calls out uh zero emission trucks five years before the executive order that you shared but also additionally we have a benchmark of 40 percent zero emission trucks by 2026 so for me i would like to see you know as you're looking at the region you're looking you know, how many trucks go through, where are the charging stations, we actually have benchmarks we want to accomplish, but benchmarks that we can go now to the federal government and say, hey, we're ready to go ahead. We're not about going, in, we're not about being in compliance. And so I want to hear more of what your plan is to meet those goals, because that was actually developed by environmental justice residents who have been suffering the impacts, who children have asthma. And the other thing is the innovative pilots. I know you didn't really touch, but if you can talk a little bit more about that, because um, just from what I've heard from discussions from our port tenants and, and, and Teamsters who represent a lot of these truck drivers is that there hasn't been a lot of assistance, like technical assistance. And so I kind of feel like there's a lot of, not just the federal dollars, but there's some money from the California Energy Commission, there's money from CARB. And so how can we functionally implement this so that we're ready and we're actually accomplishing something and we're actually transitioning it specifically communities that have suffered for a long time? Thank you. I'll address the first question first and then go to the second one. Um, so for how we're getting these, uh, or how are you, the blueprint is working in parallel with the Port of San Diego and other folks as we look at um, transitioning and providing these charging infrastructure locations or fueling infrastructure locations. I'd say that, um, you know, I was, I participated on the steering committee of the AB 617 uh, de development. And, and so we're trying to make sure that our strategy, this strategy is region wide. And so we're, we're, we're balancing the region, region's needs with the port needs as well, and trying to understand how these strategies that we're going to be starting to look into here can support the acceleration of the infrastructure deployment. We are also working with Caltrans um, to uh, seek out some of the funding that's currently available or going to be awarded here in the next month or so, or I get uh, applications are due in the next month. So we're looking to um, apply and start getting funds for public infrastructure now 
this blueprint will help long term as we like continue to look down the road, as you mentioned, unfunded opportunities. Um, and so we're going to be applying now. We're going to use this blueprint again in the future to help uh, further justify the, for the future need for funding as well. Um, but we're looking now to implement uh, charging infrastructure and fueling infrastructure on the border, the port side communities. Um, I understand that there are you know, some pretty ambitious goals from the port as far as getting charging infrastructure in now. So working uh, almost weekly with the port on, on their efforts as far as the truck transition plan goes, how the blueprint can support that, um, and, then, and then vice versa, how the truck transition plan uh, efforts can support and inform the blueprint. Um, so I, I think you know, th while this is future looking, we are still definitely very cognizant of the need for funding and fueling infrastructure now um, and working with our regional partners to uh, apply for and receive that funding now and then use this blueprint longer term. When we first got this grant award, um, there was really nothing in the space moving and and then all of a sudden, lots of funding started coming out the door. And so we, we're committed to finishing this blueprint, identifying best practices and strategies while also uh, seeking funding and trying to get infrastructure into the ground now. And then as far as the second question goes, um, innovative pilots are definitely something that we're exploring, um, and uh, the low-hanging fruit seems to be for medium-duty, heavy-duty vehicles as well for those innovative pilots. Um, wireless charging is one of the things that we've been exploring over the last few years and are looking to establish some partnerships to uh, deploy a wireless uh, charging demonstration here in the region. Um, technical assistance it would it, for for charging is a little slightly different but i think absolutely absolutely necessary something that we've done in the past here at sandag is provide technical assistance for light duty charging and understanding we um, currently have an incentive program that uh, is providing charging uh, rebates and we provided a technical assistance service through that to help the folks that would otherwise not necessarily be able to apply understand their requirements previous to that we had a technical assistance uh person or uh, service called the EV expert, which was for light duty charging infrastructure deployment. So I think that that is something, I know that the port's actually working on a uh, technical assistance program now, and we're looking to learn from them how they've been working on that. I think a near, near term strategy would be to develop more technical assistance here in the region to support that transition for folks who would not otherwise um, be able to do that or have questions about how to do it or not in the, not in the know. And then as far as the, the innovative pilots go, we wanna make sure that those pilots are complementing all of the existing work and not bringing us backwards and, and slowing us down. Uh, and uh, one thing I would like to add um, is the implementation committee, because, you know, the regional plan, you're looking into the border, the port side. And so um, if there could be a developed implementation committee, that's obviously the inner agencies, you guys are all talking, but but the residents that have been involved, because I know there's already the AB 617, but that just looks into Barry Logan, Sherman Heights, National City, West Side of National City. But if there can be an implementation committee so we can help accelerate, I think that would be helpful. So is, have those meetings been set or would you guys be considering doing that? Yeah, we have a group called the Accelerate to Zero Emissions Collaboration, which is a regional collaboration made up of uh, local government, academia, private industry, and we also have it open to the public so folks can uh, participate in our advisory group. Um, and that's how we developed that regional uh, target infrastructure number that looked at the, the 77 or 70 thousand plus vehicle needs. So we did a, we developed the gap analysis in 2021. We're currently working on a regional strategy that looks at all types of vehicles, including medium duty, heavy duty, and that's open to the public. We accept we're, we're working on that strategy, which we're expecting to release later this summer. And that A to Z, once that strategy is done, that accelerate to zero emissions collaboration is really meant to help continue that momentum. And like you said, really focus on the implementation of those strategies. Blueprint will be wrapped into that as well. So we can figure out how to uh, engage with the public as well as our uh, partners and throughout the region. And just one last clarifying question, the 70,000 trucks that you guys have identified through that group, what's the range? It, 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 it varies um, based on uh, capacity, weight that you're putting in the, in the truck, um, potential usage, but um, I'd say anywhere from 150 to 300 miles is about average right now. Um, there and and but continuing to get better as we as the battery technology improves uh, as and then also is are able to charge faster as the charging technology improves. But uh, about 150 to 300 is is somewhere in there. Probably 250 is about average. 250 is average. Yeah. Okay. And that's and we and we can actually identify infrastructure to satisfy the 250 mile range. Yeah. As part of the criteria, we're looking at the the, the average range and then the recommended mileage between those stations, and we're looking at about a 50 mile range between stations, so that there there is no range anxiety associated with that 250 mile range. Okay. Thank you. That's mm -hmm. one different. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate it. I just had a quick question it, on um, slide eight. It looks like on the the fleet mix. I was curious um, why the CNG 
buses or vehicles are in the gasoline category. Obviously, I know that they're, you know, petrol fueled, so to speak, but um, because to me, the, the aren't the CNG vehicles dramatically less emissions than regular yes, gas-powered vehicles? Yeah, and I don't think it's really easy to see. There is an orange line down there at the very oh, bottom that of that there, is? and that's just, I believe that's the CNG. It's it's really oh, it's difficult small. to see. Yeah, and it, so it is a small portion of the overall mix, but uh, to your point, it is a much cleaner fuel to be burning than gasoline or diesel. And that's not so much a focus going forward now with the newer technology of the... Correct. It, we, this blueprint's focused zero emission only. Um, okay. We do have another strategy here that's being in development called the sustainable freight strategy that is looking at near zero and zero emission strategies uh, for all types of goods movement. So that includes marine, rail, uh, trucks and buses, or excuse me, trucks. Um, and so that, that strategy is looking a little bit broader uh, as far as low to no emissions, uh, where this is just focused solely on zero emission vehicles. All right. Thank you very much for the information. Yeah, go ahead. Just a question on the same slide is on the fleet mix, the, the battery and the fuel cell, is that all replacement or is there also a factor in for conversion of existing vehicles? Yeah, so the, it would be a, a re replacement. Uh, it is, there is the potential to do conversion. It, it is generally more costly than purchasing a new vehicle and replacing an old uh, diesel or gasoline vehicle. Um, but the, the idea is replacement rather than conversion. Yeah, I was just thinking that technology changes that may change as well. So. Absolutely, yep. Zero, I'm sorry. Thanks, great presentation. And I didn't mean to bring this up because it's not quite the right forum, but I think it's worthwhile mentioning um, since we got into the CNG topic anyway, that uh, you know, when we have a chance to engage, one of the things I found interesting is, you know, there is relative to replacing equipment, there's obviously uh, greenhouse gas impacts relative to that. And one of the things that happened when I was uh, visiting a local waste hauler was, you know, their discussion and their concern about having to replace all their vehicles, which are CNG vehicles with electric ones, given that they produce the CNG on site. You know, they they actually compost and part of the uh, output of that composting uh, process is CNG, which they clean and then produce and use that to power their fleet. And I think it'd be unfortunate if we get too short, short sighted about, you know, going totally to zero emission vehicles um, and when there's opportunities for perhaps uh, letting certain uses continue along with that are most optimum. Thanks. Any no other hands? I have a few uh, questions, Jeff. Um, I know we're looking at uh, at least measurement of of uh, greenhouse gas emissions from the tailpipe. Do you also consider um, the net uh, um, emissions? Uh, for example, I, I know the, the the tailpipe emissions from a CNG vehicle is, is obviously much better than than gas and, and diesel. Um, but I've also learned recently that the amount of emissions of methane by trying to get CNG gas is much, much worse. In fact, uh, it's actually equivalent to, or if not worse than uh, burning gasoline uh, when you use CNG, because when you look at the total uh, amount of uh, emissions uh, and looking at the mining of um, of uh, propane or the, the, the gas that's used is so detrimental. Yeah, we're currently looking at the zero emission tailpipe, as you mentioned, and as a next step, looking life cycle or, or total emissions cycles will will be the would do need to be the, the next step in order to reach full decarbonization. But right now, we're really looking at that low hanging fruit. What is our our biggest bang for our buck as far as spending money and reducing emissions overall? And that's really coming from the tailpipes. Um, but longer term, as as a next step, as a deeper dive, we would need to look at uh, total life cycle emissions in order to really. Uh, reach that net zero decarbonization uh, efforts at the state. Right, and I think electric vehicles may have less maintenance than a CAG vehicle as well. Yep. And the other is, uh, I was gonna ask uh, both uh, M when MTS and NCT was here, there seem to be two pathways, one going with electric bu uh, buses, other with uh, hydrogen. Um, and, and again, I'm looking at the net emissions um, uh, of, uh, um, uh, of um, greenhouse gas emissions. Can you give me a quick synopsis of why we have, I mean, it seems like two different experiments, one with electric buses, one with uh, hydrogen. So what's what's the deal with that? And and what are we gonna learn hopefully in the future? And Sharon, please 
Shatter sure. because you, you we went electric with MTS. Yeah, so we're actually looking at hydrogen as well. So uh, we're pretty sure that the battery technology won't improve fast enough to go 100% um, battery electric buses um, because the range from some of our routes are such that we're going to need a longer range. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where hydrogen steps in because that really offers you that. Um, hydrogen fueling right now is still not a 100 I mean, it's not a green yet for production of hydrogen. So, um, you know, our uh, transition plan to all zero emission focuses on right now the battery electric, but knowing that in the near future, we're going to have to start adding some hydrogen buses. So, for instance, North County Transit District will probably recognize that um, their experiment with hydrogen is probably looking at the future. Um, and then also the lower costs associated with hydrogen mm -hmm. for operations purposes. Thank, thank you. Uh, and lastly, if there's another piece of technologies that's breaking, I, I talked to electrical consultants and engineers and they are telling me that uh, we can actually charge these uh, batteries much faster than we are uh, so that one, we can reduce the weight of the buses and trucks um, uh, if we learn how to uh, charge mass faster. So they're telling me that, you know, instead of an hour overnight, um, we can be looking at a much, much shorter time if we can uh, charge the batteries much faster, meaning, uh, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, giving these uh, trucks and buses uh, a charge, which for for our bus fleet, that would solve that problem uh, during the day, they will be able to get the charge by just taking a break, you know, a 10, 15 minute break. Is, is that also, I guess, one of the technologies that's breaking? Yeah, charging rates are continuing to get faster and faster. Right now, I think the, the max charging rate that you're looking at is about 300 kilowatts. Um, and that is a longer period of time to charge. There, uh, you, you know, Academia is working on 500 megawatt chargers, which can really do reach that gasoline type of model. Um, one of the challenges with the higher power charging rates is that the battery degradation does go down. You see a, a shorter life cycle of your battery, um, which can lead to needing more batteries. And that's not necessarily a, something we're looking for either. Um, what part of the innovative pilot um, element that we're looking at is reducing the battery size and being able to charge your vehicle um, while you're driving or, or at parking spaces so that you don't have to have such a large battery and you don't need to worry about that range anxiety so much. You are able to reduce the weight of the battery on the vehicle. You are able to put more goods on the truck. So that's part of why we're looking at the, the wireless charging concept as, as a way to reduce the battery size needs and continue to uh, allow for a, a range that is, is suitable for the operations. Great, thank you. Any other comments or discussion items? Thank you, and pardon me for getting into the weeds of the technical issues here, uh, but it was just uh, of some interest. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm slow. I, I do have a quick question. Uh, this uh, last summer, we had uh, electric power issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, for many of my constituents in my district, they were told that over that week or two week period, to try not to charge their car. If we're going to smaller batteries, and we go into a period like that, I mean, we literally could come to a full stop. Uh, is there any concern about that? Yeah, I, I don't think that uh, smaller battery and wireless charging applications are going to be applied across the board for vehicles. Uh, I think that they, the, the wireless charging application right now works best for repeatable routes that, you know, you, you know, you know which route you're going to be on, you know, the fleet, you know that you're going to have the power available. You, um, maybe you, re, you tie in some resiliency elements of demand energy response. Um, but for the passenger vehicles or folks that don't have repeatable routes, really, the wireless charging is not a solution at this point. Um, but it's part of why we're exploring the, the, the wireless charging technology to understand how we can, you know, progress that technology or support the needs of situations where you do have power safety shutoffs. Um, that's part of the, the criteria as well as the demand energy response elements. How do we tie in renewable solar or, or battery storage so that when you do have a power safety shutoff, you can rely on that battery to discharge a little bit and provide energy for uh, folks that are in need of charge or and then vice versa, being able to use your vehicle to put energy back onto the grid. Vehicle to grid is something that we're, we're looking at and um, incorporating into our comprehensive multi motor quarter plans as, as far as pilots go for resiliency and making sure that you, you're not leaving folks stranded. Okay, so that's a that was an informational item. So we could move on to that. Thank, Thank you, Jeff, for the report. 
So item uh, seven is uh, an update on uh, flexible fleet work and uh, have April and Crystal to make that presentation. So on average, cars are parked about 95% of the time. Imagine what we could do if we could mitigate that demand and see the, the changes to congestion, land use, and air quality in our region. The strong desire for people to travel alone in their cars is challenging our regional and land use planning recommendations. Innovative solutions like flexible fleets will help us achieve our region's air quality goals by addressing traffic congestion, creating equal access to our beaches and our transportation network, and meet our climate action and air, man air mandate, clean air mandates. Sandeg has implemented a flexible fleet implementation strategy along with a joint procurement bench and several pilots that I'm here to share with you today. And today I'm going to cover three points. Our plan for flexible fleet implementation at Sandag, partnerships that we have planned and are continuing to develop throughout the region, and pilots. My name is April De Jesus, and I'm a senior mobility planner at Sandag. And I also manage the flexible fleet implementation. Good morning, Transportation Committee. My name is Krista Ayala, Program Manager with the City of San Diego Sustainability Mobility Department and partnering with Sandag um, to advance the flexible fleet concept. So I'll be here to lend the local jurisdiction perspective um, and to talk about some of the exciting pilots we have underway with Sandag. Flexible fleets are one of Sandag's five big moves identified in the regional plan, and they consist of on-demand shared mobility services that may be requested through a smartphone app. These services include bike share, scooter share, microtransit, including neighborhood electric vehicles, car share, and ride hailing. An early action identified in a regional plan includes the Flexible Fleet Strategic Implementation Plan, where we worked closely with our community-based organizations to develop a roadmap for planning and implementing pilot projects throughout San Diego. In this study, we conducted a propensity analysis to identify communities that could benefit from various flexible fleet operations and to enhance regional connectivity. This included a comprehensive analysis of demographic, socioeconomic, travel demand data, and stakeholder feedback. The plan includes an implementation toolbox identifying investment considerations for each fleet type, pilot implementation considerations, and a regional action plan. An outcome of this effort includes a flexible fleet task force, which is a subset of our mobility working group and will continue working on pilot implementation efforts throughout our region. As we look to implement the regional plan, we envision a variety of partnerships, including healthcare, education, nonprofits, and jurisdictions as part of our solution. We wanted to facilitate these partnerships regardless of Sandag involvement, and we facilitated a competitive procurement, providing existing customer, uh, consistent customer experience for the implementation and encouraging data sharing to support our regional planning efforts. This joint procurement shared um, anticipated shared utilization with our local jurisdictions, and we know that each of these agency, agencies are also subject to procurement requirements, so we worked very closely with each of their contracts department to ensure that we could uh, leverage the, this investment in our joint procurement. We followed federal and state procurement rules and built-in capacity for partner agencies to utilize uh, flexible fleets, um, utilize this for flexible fleets implementation. And additional information can be found on our Sandag website if any jurisdictions would like to use it to support operations. And we are really excited today to share updates about our pilot partnerships with local jurisdictions that are currently underway. This year, we are launching three pilot projects or anticipate launching one in Pacific Beach um, one in Southeast San Diego, and those are both the Pacific Beach will be a neighborhood electric vehicle, and we anticipate a microtransit um, for Southeast San Diego. And we're also uh, working with the city of Oceanside for a shuttle as well. 
All of these pilots will be utilizing our flexible fleet joint, joint procurement contracts, and we are still working on operations assumptions with each of the operators. Um, and we're exploring um, different operating considerations like fare charging and um, where to come as we get closer to the launch. And I'll pass it over to Crystal to start on, on Pacific Beach. Uh, before we dive into the pilot, I just want to take a minute to really acknowledge um, the unique opportunity that we as cities have and the region has to really embrace technology to um, meet a, cr a crucial gap in mobility. Um, you know, our cities look really different than two years ago, um, and technology really provides a really unique opportunity to harness that, to bring some of that innovation to our communities and really unite our mobility, our safety, our climate, and our equity goals. Um, and that really provides an environment where collaboration with entities like Sandag and many other private sector partners um, can exist. So really excited to be here to share um, how we are partnering with, with Sandag. And I implore all of your cities to consider the cooperative agreement uh, approach that we are employing to bring some of these shuttles to our, to our communities. Um, the joint bench that Sandag procured really provides a unique opportunity for us as cities to leverage that to streamline how we might bring these, com these services to our communities and provides a really competitive pricing to really ensure that there's um, you know, a mechanism to sustain these services, but to also have some regional consistency. So it's really great to be able to use that resource to bring some of these concepts to the city of San Diego. And we're here to help if any of you want to reach out to us to kind of explore how we're doing it. We're happy to be a resource. Um, so the first um, pilot that I'm here to talk about is the Pacific Beach All Electric Shuttle that we're partnering with Sandag on. Um, I hope you've been following us on social media, either the city of San Diego or Sandag. And if you are, you would have seen that we um, launched a really exciting naming competition to build some excitement and some momentum around the shuttle. Um, this shuttle is, is really similar to the all electric shuttle service that operates in downtown San Diego. Um, that service is called Free Ride Everywhere, San Free Ride Everywhere Downtown, Fred. So we needed just as an iconic name for the shuttle in PB. Um, and after, um, you know, a lot of social media and excitement, we got over 600 responses and happy to announce that the shuttle is called, drum roll, April. <laughs> <laughs> the beach bug. So we'll be rolling out uh, the beach bug later this summer in partnership with Sandag and look for some exciting press and momentum around the shuttle. Um, there's been a lot of parallel initiatives that really have brought us to this point to be able to launch a, a shuttle service like this. So Sandag um, developed a mid-coast mobility hub strategy years ago that kind of laid the foundation for this. The city had a Balboa Avenue um, transit station specific plan. Um, and then last but certainly not least, the opening of the Blue Line extension really provided a unique opportunity to take a look at connectivity in Pacific Beach and explore other ways we could expand access to and from all of the awesome coastal uh, destinations you'd want to head to Pacific Beach for. Um, so once uh, launched, the shuttle service is going to provide connections to and from our trolley service um, and will also provide a new convenient and sustainable way to move around Pacific Beach equipped with wheelchair accessible vehicles and space for groceries and boogie boards. This shuttle service is hopefully gonna encourage uh, folks to leave their car at home and try a sustainable way to move around PB, head to the beach or um, connect to our transit stations. So I'm gonna hand it over to uh, April to talk about other exciting pilots that Sandag is partnering uh, with partners to explore grant funding opportunities. One of the big pieces in, in our participation in, in these efforts as a city is exploring how we can not only support the launch of these services, but also explore how our right away can be conducive to these kinds of services. So um, looking for ways to integrate supportive infrastructure, charging is gonna be top of mind for, for us as a city um, and collecting data as well to really under, understand what the impact of these services are and what that relationship to transit is in many cases. We wanna make sure that this is contributed to contributing to our mobility landscape and not competing with existing services. So I'm gonna hand it back to April. Thank you, Crystal. Uh, so another partner that partnership that we have with the city of San Diego is with Southeast San Diego. We've been working closely with the Urban Collaborative Project. Craig's here and um, we've been uh, working on it for a few years. We started with a 
clean we, we submitted a clean mobility uh, grant last month um, in order to apply for a microtransit service operations in Southeast San Diego and build on our needs assessment analysis that we completed last year. Um, they released the ranking for this program, so we anticipate being invited back for a, a second round, the second phase application, and we should hear more in the upcoming weeks. And um, we've been closely working with Southeast San Diego to identify opportunities for electric vehicle charging to support this program. So one of the things we learned as as we were planning for this is there aren't that many electric, electric vehicle chargers in this area and it's a high priority need to support this service and provide that access to this an underserved community. Uh, so we've been working very closely with Urban Collaborative Project to look at unique funding opportunities to not only plan for this microtransit pilot, but also support some uh, infrastructure investments in this region. And then I said, as I said, uh, we have also partnered with Oceanside uh, to support a pilot um, to continue the neighborhood electric vehicle for the city of Oceanside and connect to our coaster and uh, the rest of the Oceanside community. And this is a partnership with Visit Oceanside and the city of Oceanside, and we're also hoping to launch it this summer. We're working very closely with the city to get through contracts and help with the negotiations with Circuit, our operator, through our flexible fleets bench. Um, we are hoping that this circulator will enhance access to our transit network, as well as circulation for not only the residents, um, but also tourists in the, the region as well. And um, because we are closely partnering with the city of San Diego and Oceanside while negotiating some of these contracts, we've been able to leverage some of the lessons learned from each of the um, operations with our, our, in our with our operators so to better negotiate for rates and um, these pilot projects. Uh, we are closely working together to also establish um, different keep performance metrics to analyze these services as part of our pilots and also be able to share with you what success looks like for these pilots. And um, we're not only working with the city of San Diego and Oceanside, we're also working with our flexible fleet task force um, to um, understand some of the data metrics because these, these new solutions are very different from our existing transportation network and we wanna make sure that we get the data that we can in order to do a better analysis of these projects. So in, 20, in 2002, Beep, um, Beep was selected as a service provider through Sandag's request for innovation, innovative concepts. And today I will be sharing an update about this opportunity to deploy automated multi-passenger shared shuttle services and provide connections to our communities and regional transportation network. The BEEP concept includes autonomous um, vehicle shuttle operations and transportation and land use investments. And these BEEP projects include planning, management, activation, and deployment in cities that are interested in accelerating this innovative concept. And you, as you see in this top image, um, this concept leverages our mobility hub uh, strategies with a convergence of various mobility services in one location. And Sandag originally initiated discussions for this concept with the cities of El Cajon, Imperial Beach, San Marcos, and National City. But there's been so much interest from all our local jurisdictions that this um, prior Wednesday, we held a workshop with all of San Diego's local jurisdictions just to gauge in the excitement and provide a little bit more education on this concept and how we can work together for implementing throughout our region. Um, there is not currently any funding associated with this project, but as part of the, the effort, we're looking at innovative funding sources through both public-private partnerships. So with the, our traditional funding mechanisms as, all, as well as some new funding mechanisms. So if um, your city wants to engage on this concept, um, please contact me if they haven't already. So the BEEP concept is a uh, a phase implementation of several mobility nodes to create a mobility hub. And each, oops, and each node will include electric vehicle infrastructure generated through solar power and um, solar power, and then also include an autonomous shuttle. And 
part of the part of the collaboration for this effort is working with the local jurisdictions to identify these locations and then the private sector will come in and make sure that the grid has capacity to provide electric vehicle charging for the community as well as these um, multimodal options in at that node and then uh, the sh the autonomous shuttle would connect each of the nodes to each other and also connect to our regional transportation network. And it, it's kind of developed into two different phases. So in the first phase, there would be three to four nodes connecting. And as that shows success, there'd be another expansion of another three to four nodes. So you'll start to see like uh, a, mul a domino effect of multiple nodes creating a one large mobility hub for that community. And each node is about um, about a mile separated from each other. So they're very closely connected, but also provides different opportunities for that first mile, last connect, last mile connection in each community. So if the if anyone is interested in learning more about our flexible fleet initiatives, um, this is our contact information. And we are really excited about the deployment of our partnerships and our flexible fleet um, pilot projects. And um, we are hoping to come back and share the success of these projects and prove what can happen if we change our our, uh, our culture of being car dependent and trying to find flexibility with that new mediated need. If you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you, uh, April. Uh, do we have any public comments first? Thank you, Chair. We have three public commenters on this item. The first is Craig Jones, who is here in person, who will be followed by Catherine Rhodes virtually. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak on this item. I'm Craig Jones. I'm uh, working as a a volunteer with the Urban Collaborative Project on the Southeast San Diego uh, project that uh, staff noted. Um, I recall that during the preparation of the Regional Transportation Plan adopted in 2021, there was a map exhibit that was prepared that showed the reach of the entire San Diego region that would be within 10 minutes or less access into the public transportation system if the whole system is uh, implemented. What this means, this is a tremendous promise. It means that this vast reach of the San Diego region would be able to use public transportation as an alternative to the private automobile system. To make this system work, however, the um, flexible fleets component, a robust, effective, efficient and affordable flexible fleets component is absolutely necessary. So we're very happy to see the emphasis given by Sandag uh, on flexible fleets implementation. Um, for the Southeast San Diego project, we're very happy to see this move forward. We hope uh, that we can get the grant funding that staff noted for the uh, VIA Southeast San Diego project. Um, a key that's not currently included in our grant funding proposal is an electric uh, charging station for the via electric vehicles. Hopefully we can find an interim solution at least, but I'm wondering if the beep component can provide a longer term permanent uh, charging station for the Southeast San Diego project area as well. Thank you for supporting flexible fleets in the San Diego region. Thank you. Our next speaker is Catherine Rhodes, who will be followed by the final speaker, Udayan Tandon. Catherine, please go ahead. Hello, this is Catherine Rhodes. Um, please make the PB shuttle from the new Midcoast Trolley Balboa Station to the beach free with an M MTS compass card for at least three years. You know, you have $25 million for this project and you still have 23.7 million. So you actually do have money to spend on this project that could actually, um, you know, be spent right now. The money is yours, you have it in your budget. So um, what I would like for you to do is to make the PB shuttle free for equity to increase coastal access to Pacific Beach for families from the inland neighborhoods and other funding opportunities for a free PB shuttle is to ask the County Board of Supervisors for some of the $500 million remaining in unused federal ARPA funds for equity. And 
what I mean by free is that if you have a, um, a compass card, it would be free to go onto the PB shuttle, kind of just like a, tra a, a transit pass. And so you want to increase new ridership on the Mist Coast trolley, and you want people in Pacific Beach to get rid of it, to not use their cards. I think that if you charge um, some money just for the shuttle to get to the trolley, and then more money for the trolley, that would, um, you know, you won't get as much ridership. Um, so right now, the plan is to have a 50-50 cost sharing agreement, and that would require the installation of new parking meters at Pacific Beach. So right now, where we don't have any um, paid parking, you're going to be putting paid parking at the beach. And I think that's just something that um, is not good for beach access. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our, spy, our final speaker is Udayan Tandon. Please go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Odayan Tandon. I'm from UCSD. Uh, I'm a researcher here doing research on worker agency and technology. And I really appreciate uh, the effort that Sandang has put in planning the Flexible Fleets program. I think uh, it's really good to like fill transit gaps uh, so that we bridge first last mile problems in our transit infrastructure. But I wanted to express a critique of the transit providers, the contractors that we've chosen for this public procurement. Lyft has time and time again shown that they're willing to break labor law to go around our California public legislature to, uh, to disadvantage workers in California. They were recently in court uh, as well, and they continued their Prop 22 funded proposition continues to be challenged in court again and again. I would urge Sandag to, re to rethink partnering with Lyft. Also, other contractors on this procurement will take money away from San Diego communities. These are venture capital-backed companies. Instead, we should consider investing back into San Diego communities. We have our local taxi industry, which is locally regulated, publicly accountable. We should consider remaking this program and investing in our local taxi industry. Our local taxi industry was regulated back in the 2010s to like trans transition to a majority hybrid fleet uh, through local regulation. We can do the same again by passing local regulation and transitioning them to an electrical fleet. We have local infrastructure and taxi stands that we can upgrade by installing EV chargers. This would be in line with San Diego's equity statement, which has been so far missing worker equity in it. I recognize there are a lot of labor champions in the room. Please reconsider uh, remaking this program to invest in local San Diego communities. That concludes the public commenters. Thank you. Any comments from uh, committee members? Mayor Sanchez. Thank you very much. And um, we have had a really good relationship with Yellow Cab um, for many years. And um, so this is really in addition to that. Um, and I will say that our program, pilot program started actually last year. Um, and I, I believe it was a six, was it eight month program um, that we actually didn't really um, pause because we had, we used it for art with ARPA funds. And um, so, Again, we picked up a lot of data doing this. Um, it was really, really well received. And it, it comes with an app. That's how you call it. So there's um, the first year, of course, last year was uh, at zero cost to the, uh, you know, to the folks who were using it. Uh, interestingly enough, and this was uh, downtown basically. So hoping to cut down on the travel, the the uh, car use for the downtown area, certain areas also include one uh, low income Latino neighborhood. Um, and uh, one of the interesting things is that we found out that, um, well, first of all, everybody loved it. We had zero negative. Um, that 60% were basically tourists, right? But 40% were residents. And as the residents especially were hoping we would continue to use it to do it. Um, Circuit did come to us um, with, a, with a potential contract for a year. It was cost prohibitive. So it, initially we said, no, we love the experience. We have to figure out how we can make this happen. 
didn't think that this would could happen and then um, found out that Sandag was interested in in seeing that it go for like a second year and um, visited Oceanside also stepped up which is you know they really loved it and thought it was a very good experience Main Street is also looking into it so Great as a connector because uh, we do have the transit center, to, to, especially downtown and the hotels, and um, and and also exploring the idea of having the hotels, you know, uh, pay into this. Um, but we're also connecting to um, and actually going farther down to Southo, um, but also picking up another uh, low-income Latino neighborhood. Um, so to see, you know, um, how can we do this? How can we make this really? Um, Cost effective number one. We're also looking at how much it could cost, you know. Um, but the app, the app really was an easy app to use, and um, we're looking forward to doing this again. We would not be doing this unless Sandag had. We had found out that Sandag was interested in seeing yet another year to pick up more data and seeing how we can make this a reality. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Councilman Duncan. Thank you for your um, very interesting presentation. The city of Coronado is currently starting to review a uh, flexible shuttle program to uh, particularly for during the summer to supplement the current MTS uh, CNG buses we use for a summer shuttle program because the traffic and the congestion is just insane there during the summer. Um, I just had a couple questions, quick questions. Um, in regard to BEEP, how does that, what is that, or how does that relate to, for instance, the preferred provider um, circuit? Hi, I'll answer that. Um, so there are two separate processes, right? Um, we were working with um, Flexible Fleet for the procurement um, projects that we knew were going to deploy in the near term. So the Flexible Fleet bench gives us access to circuit via other providers that we can use now. BEEP has some capital investments, infrastructure investments that need to happen that will take a couple of years to get up and running. And so that's running, um, you know, simultaneously on the track. And they have um, capital, they have private investors that they're bringing to the table and looking for right away that they can use to generate revenue to help fund some of the um, the services as well. So it's a very, very different model. So with the flexible fleet bench, it's about, you know, traditional funding sources, paying a vendor for traditional uh, flexible fleet services. With BEEP, it's a little bit of a longer term pro process. You would be looking at a longer term arrangement um, because it's a public private partnership and they're bringing private capital to the table. Um, you would need a longer term commitment um, and you would have, you know, a private partner for, uh, you know, 10, 20 years. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. And then just um, a quick comment. I see the flexible fleets at sandag.org email you mentioned, but I know staff from the city of Coronado would want to talk with both of you. If you have contact information I could get, I would really appreciate it. Yeah, definitely. The the flexible fleet sets and I don't, or it gets forwarded to me. Okay. So it's going to get to me, but I can also send you my email. Okay. And we'll send out my information after as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, you know, it's it's great to have mayors and council members from the cities that are being affected by these programs give actual uh, questions and then actual uh, testimony. So it's great to hear that. It's going to, of course, make the rest of us uh, jealous. I, I forgot to mention that we have charging um, stations at Civic Center downtown yeah, just just go ahead and rub it in thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, I wanted to make sure that i did that rub that in <laughs> great any other comments um from com any of the committee members if if not um that should complete our agenda um our next uh, <clears throat> transportation committee meeting is uh, scheduled for uh, friday may 5th at 9 a.m um and with that we are adjourned Thank you.